Martin Luther translated the Bible into the German language, he wasn't sure what to do with the book of James. I said this way back when we introduced this series on James, but Martin Luther was not a fan of the letter of James. He didn't like it. Ultimately, he decided that he would include it in his German translation of scripture, but he put it at the very end, behind Revelation. He decided that it is part of the Bible, but because he didn't like it, he decided it should be at the very end. Why didn't he like James? The reason Martin Luther didn't like James for what we're going to talk about today, faith and works. See, Martin Luther didn't like the way James seemed to indicate that it's our works and not our faith that saves us. How are we to understand as Christians today, how are we to understand the relationship between faith and works? Does faith save us? Do works play a part in our salvation? Wednesday night, if you were here, we talked about the relationship between saving faith and repentance, and we're going to continue that this coming Wednesday night again. But tonight, or for this morning, we're going to talk about the relationship between faith and works. It certainly seems to me that Paul and James had different things to say about the topic of faith and works. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at, at what Paul said and what James said. But here's what we're going to conclude this morning. I'm going to give you the end here at the beginning. We're going to conclude this morning that Paul and James really aren't at odds with each other. And it's not our works that saves us. But we're going to see this morning how we can harmonize what James had to say against what Paul had to say. So if you're in your Bibles, we're going to be in James chapter 2. And this morning we're going to finish James epistle. Next week the plan is to go into Jude. And we're going to finish the letter of James today. If you're in James chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 14, and we're going to look first of all at the debate between Paul and James. The debate between Paul and James. Look at what James says in verse 14 of chapter 2. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? That simple question right there has driven people crazy for the last 2,000 years. What good is it, my brothers? He's talking to the church. What good is it if you say you have faith, but you don't have works? Is your faith enough to save you if there's no works? It certainly seems like James takes a different position than the Apostle Paul. What are some things that Paul wrote about this topic of faith versus works? Let's understand what Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. A passage that's probably familiar to many of us in this room. Paul had written these words. He said, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not about works, Paul said, lest anyone should boast. Or so that we have nothing that we can brag about. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Paul clearly says that we're saved by grace through faith apart from works. What else does Paul say on the topic? In Titus 3, 5, another familiar verse, Paul said, It's not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Not about works, Paul said to Titus. And then Paul continued in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, Paul summed up salvation this way. He said, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deed of the law. Paul could have been clearer on his position. Paul clearly taught that salvation is wholly of faith and that a person's good works are not a factor in their salvation. But what did James say right here in verse 14? What good is it, my brothers? You say you have faith, but no works. Can your faith really save you? Isn't that the opposite of what Paul appears to be saying here? Paul's saying it's faith, not works. Faith, not works. Faith, not works. And James says, you have faith, but no works. What good is your faith? What good is it has an implied negative answer. In other words, James is saying something like this. Oh, yeah, you say you believe, but if you don't have works, your belief is pointless. Yeah, he's asking a question, but his answer is implied. It's a rhetorical question. What's the point of saying, yeah, I believe, but you don't have works? Maybe you have a person that you share the gospel with. Or maybe just through evangelism. At some point in your life, you've asked a person, hey, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? If your life ended today, do you think you'd go to heaven? They say, well, sure, I believe in Jesus. And you know that person is out getting drunk every night of the week. You know that person's out just sleeping around. You know that person's doing all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the Lord. They say, well, sure, I believe in Jesus. 
I think we can share James' frustration here. What good is it to say you believe if we don't see the works in your life? Is that belief alone enough to save a person? Think about that for a second before we begin to answer that question. Because I think we say on paper, well, sure, believe all you have to do is believe. Paul said it. Ephesians 2, Titus 3, Romans 3. All you got to do is believe. But think about that person you know. Uh, they, they have the foulest mouth you've ever heard. Always losing their temper. Never doing anything that remotely looks like they've even touched a Bible. And they say, well, sure, I believe. Is that belief really enough? Is that person really going to go to heaven? We can see that Paul and James seem to be on opposite sides of this debate. Martin Luther, who's the father of the Reformation. I said a minute ago, he didn't like James. For this reason, Martin Luther did not like chapter 2, beginning in verse 14 down to the end of the chapter. Martin Luther didn't like it, and his followers today, those that refer to themselves as being reformed today, share a similar disdain for the letter of James. But I think they were a little too hasty to, to, to throw James to the end of the Bible. I think they were a little too hasty to say that James is teaching heresy here. But to be fair to Martin Luther, let's try to put this in Martin Luther's context. In 1517, when the Protestant Reformation was just beginning, Martin Luther was fed up with the Roman Catholic Church because they were teaching a works-based salvation. The Roman Catholic Church teaches what we refer to today as sacramentalism, that by obeying the sacraments that a person can be saved. So the Roman Catholic Church would say, no, 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 it's not about belief, it's about going to Mass, it's about doing penance, it's about confession, it's about making pilgrimages to holy sites. They have seven sacraments. They said, if you do these seven things, you can, in essence, earn your salvation. Martin Luther hated all things that even hinted of a works-based salvation. And here he comes to James saying, show me your works. You say you believe, but where's your works? And so in the context of the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther would look at James and say, man, he sounds like the Pope. He sounds like he's trying to teach us that we've got to work in order to be saved. So to be fair to Martin Luther, we put it in the context where they were trying to murder him for preaching that faith alone saves and not works. So he'd look at something like James and say, this goes against everything I'm risking my life for. This goes against everything I've rebelled against the Catholic Church for. And so we can kind of see in Martin Luther's defense why he had such disdain for James. Martin Luther concluded what he said in Latin, sola fide and sola gratis, that salvation is by faith alone, by grace alone. If God did not give us grace, we, didn't have, we wouldn't even have the ability to believe. So God gives us his grace that we don't earn, and then by our faith, which is not a work, we're saved. That's what the Protestant Reformation was built on, sola fide, sola faith, by faith alone. How do we reconcile Paul and Martin Luther and, and our, we're Protestants, let's be honest, our Protestant heritage, how do we reconcile that with James' question? What good is it if you say you believe, if you say you have faith? But we don't see works in your life. How do we bring these two together? I said this the other week, uh, and I'll say it again. I think, actually, I think I said it already in Bible study earlier in the morning. But I look at faith and works. No, it was Wednesday night I said this. I look at faith and works as being best friends. We approach this debate. How do we reconcile Paul and James? How do we reconcile faith and works? I don't think we have to reconcile two friends. I don't think they're at odds with each other. I think they go hand in hand, and we just have to understand the distinction. John MacArthur said it like this. He said, Paul and James are not face-to-face -face confronting each other. They're actually back-to-back -back confronting two common enemies. Paul and James, I, I call it the debate here this morning, but they're not really debating with each other. They're not standing face-to-face -face as if in an argument. I think we might look at Paul and look at James, and we conclude that Paul, if they were really in the same room, Paul would be looking at James saying, James, it's faith, it's faith, it's faith. And James would point his finger back at Paul and say, no, it's works, Paul, it's works, it's works. And we get this idea that they're standing face to face, yelling at each other, arguing with each other. But John MacArthur says, no, they're actually standing back to back, fighting a common enemy. Of course, the enemy is not a physical one, but a spiritual one. They're fighting two different heresies. But ultimately, they're fighting a spiritual battle. I just picture Paul and James standing back to back. Paul saying, James, I'm going to take care of these guys. James, if you take care of those guys. And standing back to back here, we can guard each other. 
So what was the enemy that they were confronting? For Paul, it was about legalism. What Paul wrote, and the reason Paul wrote so much of what he wrote, is to confront people that were teaching that in order to make it to heaven, you've got to do. You've got to work. You've got to do this and this and this and this. If you want to be saved, you've got to go to church every Sunday if you want to make it to heaven. You've got to read your Bible every morning or every night and say your prayers if you want to make it to heaven. You've got to make sure that you've removed all those things from your life if you want to make it to heaven. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. It's not about what we've done. It's about who we trust in. It's about our faith and not our works. But James is over here fighting against a completely different kind of heresy. James is fighting something that we would refer to today as an easy believism. It's the people that say, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter at all what you do. You don't have to go to church to be saved. I hear that all the time. And do you, do you go to church anymore? No, but I don't have to go to church to be saved. This easy believism. You don't have to go to church to be saved. You don't have to give your money. It doesn't matter. God doesn't love you any more if you go to church. And he doesn't love you any less if you don't. You don't have to give up that alcohol addiction. No, you don't have to get married to that person you're living with. You don't have to do any of that stuff just so long as you believe. Both are wrong in their extreme forms. And so Paul is saying to all those people saying, work, 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 work. He's saying, no, just believe. And James is looking at all these people saying, it doesn't matter what you do. He's saying, where are the good works in your life? Where's the evidence that you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Because Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he becomes what? A new creation. That old stuff is going to pass away, and all things are going to become new. If you're really in Christ, I'm just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe. Like on Easter when, when the church is packed and people say, yeah, no, I know, the, I know the resurrection story. I know about the cross. On Christmas when church is packed and everybody says, oh, I know all about baby Jesus. But where is the works? Where is the changed life to say, oh, yeah, I've got it up here. I've heard the story a hundred times. I believe it. Where's the works? Where's the evidence that you've actually been saved. Because if works is how a person is saved, how many works? How many good things do we have to do then to make it to heaven? Because I haven't found the Bible verse yet that says if you do this many good things, then you can make it to heaven. If you remove this many bad things, then you can make it to heaven. I haven't found anything about our church attendance as far as a requirement to heaven. I haven't found how much we have to do, how often we have to do it. If it's about a ratio or a percentage, I haven't found anything like that in the Bible. So if you want to say we've got to work to be saved, how much work? Who defines work? Who defines what things have to be removed? But understand this is the equation, church. It's not faith plus works equals salvation. It's not faith plus works equals salvation. But it is saving faith always produces good works. Saving faith will always produce good works. So here's my conclusion to you today on this debate. Good works, they are not required for salvation, but they are most definitely required from salvation. Good works are required in order to be saved, but if you say you've been saved, there had better be good works. John Calvin, another member of the Protestant Reformation, said it this way. Faith alone justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. Faith alone justifies, but a faith that justifies is never alone. It will always be accompanied by good works. You say you're a Christian, there had better be some good works as evidence, as proof in your life today. I read three verses from Paul in Ephesians 2 and Titus 3 and, and Romans 3. But I want us to remember what else Paul said in those very same passages. We read Romans, I mean Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you're saved. Through faith, not of yourselves, not of works. The very next verse in verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Paul's very clear. We're saved by grace through faith, and then the good works will naturally come. I read uh, Titus 3, 5, but Titus 2, 7 says, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. I read Romans 3, 28, but Romans 2, 6, and 7 says, He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Yes, Paul wrote that works do not save, but he always wrote that the saved will work. Our works do not save us, but the saved will most definitely work. So we talked about this debate 
between Paul and James, but I don't think it's a debate at all. I think they're really on the same side of this equation. So let's talk about the distinction, the distinction between faith and works. If you're in chapter 2, we'll pick up in verse 15, and we'll go down to 19. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. To that, James says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Do you believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble, or shudder, as the ESV says. In this next portion of the scripture here, James gives us two examples to make a distinction between faith and works. The first example that he gives us is a person who claims to be a true follower of Jesus and sees a person with physical needs, and what does he say to them? Go in peace, be warm, be filled. That'd be like somebody saying today, good luck out there, God bless you, I'm praying for you. Isn't that the church cop out today? Well, that sounds rough, but I'm praying for you. We, we do that, and, and our prayer, we should. We should pray for and with everybody. But if we have the ability to meet those needs, James says, that is a proof, it's evidence of the fact that we really have the same faith. If you're a Christian and you're unmoved by the person beside you who's in need, you have the ability to meet that need, and you're not motivated to do anything about it, have you really been saved? Has Jesus really changed your heart? Has his Holy Spirit really filled your life? You say, well, we can't meet every single need. That's not what he says. He says, if a person has a specific need, the implication in the way he says it indicates that he's talking about being able to meet this need. No, I can't meet every need, but I can meet this one. But I go away unmoved, untouched, not sympathetic at all. I got a $20 bill burning a hole in my wallet, but I don't give it to the person who's starving. I've got an extra coat in my closet, but I don't give it to the man who's freezing. I have the ability to meet a need, and I say, hey, go in peace, be warm, be filled. I hope somebody gives you a jacket. I hope somebody gives you dinner. Good luck with that. Is that person really saved, James says? Now, it's not the act of giving away money. It's not the act of giving away clothing that saves a person. But a saved person who has the opportunity to meet a need will naturally want to meet <coughs> Hurricane Florence pounded the eastern coast a few weeks ago. I love how the Southern Baptist Convention has responded. And the media only loves to talk about the SBC when one of our pastors falls into some type of sin. The media never seems to mention that the Southern Baptist Convention disaster relief is the most benevolent organization in the entire world, doing far more good than the American Red Cross, the USAID, or any other institution out there that does good. I'm not saying not to give to those the Red Cross does a lot of good. The people at the top take a huge cut of everything that's given. But everything done through the SBC disaster relief goes straight to helping people. And in our county this past week, as churches work together to take up supplies, first aid, food, clothing, and ship it down to the East Coast, that's what the church is supposed to do. As I stood outside Walmart and saw some of you last Saturday going into Walmart and coming out with things to put on a trailer that Buffalo Baptist loaded up and took down to Myrtle Beach. That's what the church is all about. You say, I can't help every single person and all the water damage and all the lost homes and all the flooding. No, but can you give a couple of cans of soup? Can you give some toothbrushes and toothpaste and deodorant and shampoo? Can you go into Walmart just throw a couple extra bucks in your car and take it out here and help people? But instead of we're unmoved by compassion and say, well, that's what they get for living on the beach. I, I don't envy, I mean, I, I don't feel sorry for those people. Well, they need to wake up to the ocean every morning. Oh, I feel real sorry for them, and then we go on about our day. How can we say the love of Christ is really in us? If we have the opportunity to meet a need, we say, ah, good luck with that. Somebody else will do it. Have you really been saved? Not that giving our stuff saves us, saves us, but someone who's been saved is going to want to do that. He gives the example of a person who chooses not to meet a, the world, uh, another person's needs out in the world. But the second example he gives is kind of unsettling. Oh, you say you believe in God. Okay, good. You say you believe God's one. Okay. So the demons. It's kind of harsh. 
Yeah, the demons believe that same stuff. So what are you bragging about? The demons believe in God, too. You know there's not a single demon that's an atheist? There's not one demon that's agnostic. There's not one Mormon demon anywhere in the world. There's not a single demon that believes anything less than what this book tells us. They've been around almost from the beginning. And the demons probably have better theology than many of us. The demons are monotheistic. They believe in one God. The demons, they don't say, oh, Jesus was just a good teacher. Jesus was just a, a man. No, they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. The demons understand that Jesus shed his blood to bring salvation. You know what else? The demons are creationists. The demons understand that it was the Lord who created this world and not evolution. Now, they invented Darwinian evolution, I'm convinced. They're the ones that teach that and whisper that and mislead people with that. But I believe the demons are young earth creationists. They know all these truths about God. The demons believe this stuff. But what do they do? Repent of their sins? Walk an aisle? Get baptized? No. They shudder with fear. They tremble at the reality of who Jesus is. They rejoice when they nail him to a cross. They high-fived each other when they put his body in a tomb. But when he stepped forward that Sunday morning, they've been shuddering and trembling in fear ever since. The demons have good theology, but what does that theology benefit them? You want to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe in God, sure. Yeah, no, I know the Easter story. Yeah, you don't have to tell me about all that. Yeah, I know it. Yeah, some of the demons. Yeah, they believe in God, too. Are you just acknowledging it, or is it changing your life? Is it motivating you to do something different? To be something different. The demons believe in one God and tremble. But if the demons saw somebody in need of a coat, if they saw somebody who was hungry, they're not going to give away a coat. They're not going to feed a person. They believe in God, but there's no works in their life. A lot of times people just isolate this verse to say, well, believing is not enough to save a person because even the demons believe. That's not what James is just trying to say here. I think James is trying to make a distinction between those of us that say, yeah, I believe, versus those of us that actually do something. I see this a reference to the Shema of Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Hebrew, it's Shema. In Hebrew, it, it means here. It's translated in English as here. In Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, it's something that Jews recite every morning and every night. And for many Jewish children, it's their very first words are reciting the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. When Jesus was asked the greatest commandment, that is what he quoted, the Shema. And everybody knew what he was referring to. So James gives us the first part of it. The demons, they believe that God is one. That's the first half of the Shema. But they stop short of loving the Lord with all their heart, soul, and strength. How many of us do that same thing? We believe in God right here, but we stop short of loving him. We stop short of loving our neighbor as ourselves. I worry that churches across America today are going to be filled with people that carry their Bibles and look their Sunday best, and they walk in and they believe some things about God up here, but they don't love him with all their heart. They believe some things about God in their mind, but they don't love their neighbor as themselves. And they leave thinking they feel good about their eternal destiny because they believe that God is one. They believe that God is real. But that belief has never made its way from their head to their heart, from their brain to where it really matters right here. It's never changed their heart or their life. And if that's the case, it's not changed their destiny either. They're in the same boat with the demons who believe and yet shudder, trembling with fear, but doing nothing about it. He says, oh, you believe? Well, that's great. So do the demons. I'm going to say more about this Wednesday night, but I know that not everybody comes Wednesday night. You're in a one or you work in different things. I'll say more about this Wednesday. But it's important that it's said today that in Hebrew and in Greek, there is a, a, a way of speaking that does not exist in English. Our word faith in English exists only as a noun. I have faith. I'm part of the faith. It's something that we <coughs> say exists in a tangible sense. It's only a noun. It's a thing. In both Hebrew and Greek, the Bible uses faith as an action verb, and we have no way of doing that in English. So in essence, what must I do to be saved? Believe in Jesus Christ and you can be saved. In, in Greek, that's uh, the word faith used as a verb. In other words, how do you be saved? It's not just have faith, but it's Faith. What do I have to do to be saved? Faith Jesus. 
faith in God. <laughs> Not have faith. That's like saying, oh, I, I believe it up here. But do something with it. Your faith must be an action verb. The faith that I say I have, it ought to work out through my hands and feet. To be the body of Jesus Christ down here, we must faith every day. We must faith God. We must not just believe it, but do it. And there's no way to say that in English. And it's divided churches. Because of it, it's pretty much since the English language was invented. Because we have no way of making a distinction. So in the New Testament, you see the word trust. It's the closest way we can say it. To make, to make faith a verb. We say trust in God. Don't just believe in him, but trust in him. Because trust entails a little bit of action on our part, but it still is not quite the same as saying it in Hebrew or Greek. It's just an unfortunate English thing. But so we have to make sure that we understand the difference. Do you believe in God or are you trusting in him? Do you believe in him right here or are you doing something with that belief? And so make sure that we understand this today, church, that it is not believing in God that saves. It is trusting in God that saves. It is not believing that God is good that saves. It's trusting in that good God. It's not believing that God is eternal that saves. It's trusting in our eternal God. It's not believing that God is holy that saves. It's trusting <laughs> in a holy God. And we can add every characteristic of that to God and say, oh, yeah, I believe that. That's not enough. We have to trust in that God that we say we believe in. If you say you believe but your actions do not match your words, then you're not really trusting in God to save you. So what do we do about it? Number three, and we'll close with this point, we have to see the development. We've talked about the debate between Paul and James. We've looked at the distinction between faith and works. But here's the development. It's faith, then works. Here's the order of events for us in our life. As it applies to our salvation and how to live, it's faith and then works. It's not works and then saved. It's faith and then works. You put your faith in God, you're saved. But then your works. If you have your Bibles there in chapter 2, let's finish the chapter. We'll pick up in verse 20, and we'll close. He says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God. And it was counted or imputed to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, <coughs> was not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. It seems like another contradiction here. Wait, 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 wait. Isn't he saying that Abraham and Rahab were saved, not by their faith, but by their works, justified by their works. No, let's look at the distinction. Let's look at this on a timeline. Works are the proof that a person has really been saved. So he gives two more examples here. The first example he gives is Abraham, and the second is Rahab. But we have to understand that justified, the word that he brings up a few times here, justified has two parts to it. There's a part where we are justified in God's sight, and that happens by our faith. But there's also a part where we're justified before one another, and that happens through our works. In other words, you claim to be a Christian at work or around the house or at school, and it's your works that validate your claim to faith. You say, oh, I'm a Christian. Yeah, well, are you one of those hypocrite Christians that they always talk about? Or are you the real deal? Your works will validate your claim. I bring up Tim Tebow a lot, not just because I'm a big Florida Gator fan, but because Tim Tebow is just a pretty good guy, isn't he? And people look at Tim Tebow, and, and there's people in the world that hate Tim Tebow. There's no reason to hate the guy, right? Unless you just pull for some other team and he just beat you every time. Now, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. But Tim Tebow is a good guy. But he practices what he preaches, doesn't he? You don't always see Tim Tebow out at bars getting drunk or out, you know, getting arrested for DUI. You don't always see Tim Tebow out with another girl every night of the week, having children all across the country with all these people. Like you see so many celebrities. No, Tim Tebow seems to be the real deal. He's been the public eye now for 
15 years, and he just seems like a really good Christian guy. And so Tim Tebow is justified by his words before his accusers. There's people that watch his every move. They read his every tweet. They come through everything in his life trying to find a speck that they can make into a molehill, a mountain. Does that have the expression? They're trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. They're looking for anything in his life they can use against him. But time after time, he's justified by his works. Saved by his faith, but justified in front of his accusers, in front of fellow man, by the things that he does. Take Abraham, for example, and that's what James does. Take Abraham. Wasn't Abraham justified when he offered up his only son, Isaac? Yeah, justified before everybody standing around him. In Genesis 15 and 22, we read two important accounts of Abraham's life. In chapter 15, the Bible says Abraham believed, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. In other words, he became right in God's eyes when he believed. But James says, wait, 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 wasn't he justified by his works? Well, let's understand the timeline. Let's understand the distinction. He was justified before God by his faith when he believed. And God called him, according to Hebrews, to go into a land that God would show him later. And it says, Abraham obeyed, and he went out not knowing where he was going. He believed in God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. But then God said, hey, go offer up your only son, Isaac. And so he goes with his people around him. He gets to the base of the mountain, and he says, you guys wait here, and the lad and I, we will return. And so he goes up. He does exactly what he says. He comes back down. He was justified before everybody in his household, before every servant, his wife, everybody that he knew. He was justified by his faith in God. I'm going to follow through with it. I'm going to do what God says to do. And I'm going to walk up that mountain without an animal to sacrifice. But I'm going to go up with a knife. I'm going to go up with a rope. I'm going to go up with stuff to make fire. And me and my son will return again. I don't know how it's going to happen, but the Bible says that he believed that even if God had to raise Isaac back from the dead, he could do it. And he went up and he was justified before his fellow people by his works. Saved by his faith in God and accounted to him as righteousness because he believed, but justified before mankind by his works. Same with Rahab. Rahab was everything that Abraham wasn't. He was a Jewish man. She was a Gentile woman. He was a man of honorable reputation. She was a woman of ill repute. James even is sure to give us her occupation when he brings her up again. We know about Rahab. In fact, just last uh, two Sunday nights ago, I preached on Rahab. So we'll go into all that tonight and this morning. But we know who Rahab was. We know what she did. But we also know she was saved the same way as Abraham. She believed. She believed. She was justified when she hid the spies. Here. Come up here, hide in this flax. I'll tell them them you went that way. She believed in God, but she was justified before the spies, before Moses, or before Joshua, before all of Israel. She was justified by her works before them. We have to understand the distinction. We're saved when we put our faith in God. It's accounted to us as righteousness when we believe. But our testimony before other people is when we practice what we preach, when they see the Christian conduct, when they see the good works, when they see the change in our life. Maybe it's your old drinking buddy. Maybe it's the people you used to run around with, and you don't do that stuff anymore because you've been saved. Not saved by your good works, saved by your faith, but they see the reality of it. You're justified in their sight when they see the change in your life. And he closes in verse 20 by telling us, just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith, it doesn't have works, is dead. That word dead means unproductive or fruitless. How'd your gardens do this year? I know for some of you it's a pretty good year. I know that because I ate a lot of the stuff from your gardens. Thank you once again. The okra was fantastic. The tomatoes, the, the everything. The, uh, what's that, Richard, that melon you get me called? Cantaloupe, my mind is blessed. Thank you. That's some good cantaloupe this year, Richard. But it was a good year. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, as we were going through James, and we talked about the farmer. We talked about wisdom and how the farmer has to wait patiently on God for the former rains and latter rains. And so no amount of worry can make things grow any bigger or faster or better. And I talked about my peanuts. Remember that? And so I got these big peanut plants growing out there, but I have no idea what's under the surface. 
because peanuts grow on the roots. And with Hurricane Florence coming, I said, we're going to be uh, trapped inside for a while. And so I was thinking it would be a good time to go check on my peanuts. So Reagan and I went out there in the garden. I said, Reagan, we're going to pull up one. Because if we pull up this plant, there's like one peanut on it. We're not going to pull up anymore. We're going to be patient. We're going to wait. And we pulled up that first one. And man, I was thrilled. Peanuts everywhere. So I pulled up the next one and the next one and the next one. And, and me and Reagan had to go get bowls and fill them up with the peanuts and bring them in. And it was a bumper crop to me. It was 113 peanuts. <laughs> I wasn't trying to get rich off of them. I don't, I don't have a peanut stand anymore. But, uh, but what I wanted to do was with college football season among us, I wanted one crock pot full of boiled peanuts. And that's what I got. And it, and it lasted me through the weekend. All day Saturday watching football were raining in. And Sunday, you know, I had, had some peanuts left over and I was thrilled about it. But could you imagine if I went out there and I pulled that first and there was nothing on it? Because I, I've talked to so many of you about these peanuts. I just couldn't wait to pull that first plant up. And man, I was thrilled when it was covered. And when I say covered, I mean like a dozen. But I was, I was thrilled. I was thrilled to see those peanuts on there. But what disappointment there would have been if you pulled it up and there's nothing. Because, I mean, these things were this tall. I mean, they were getting huge. And I just think, there's got to be a lot of peanuts on here. And if I pulled that up, and, man, I planted them back in, what, April or May, you know, tilled up the land. Thank you, Rick, for letting me use your tiller. I, I tilled up the ground. I planted the seeds. Man, we watered. We pulled weeds. You know, you know how it is. You work and you work and you work all to come down to one thing. Now, when it's tomatoes, you see them all over the place. You eat them throughout the summer. You know, when it's your bell peppers or whatever it is you're picking off of, you can see them throughout the summer. But when it's the peanuts, you have no idea. You're going in blind, but just full of anticipation. And I could not wait to pull those up. But if I pulled up and there was nothing, then I would have been crushed. I would have been like a kick in the stomach. I'd be like, what was the use? What was the point of all that? Going out there in the evenings and watering, pulling the weeds, man, all the sweat and the times your back hurts and the bending over and getting down on your knees and caring for these things. What would be the point to do all of that? And it's fruitless. It's unproductive. James says, faith, if not accompanied by works, it's pointless. It's unproductive. It's fruitless. You know what that is? Oh, yeah, sure, I believe. I believe in God. That's like a peanut plant this tall. Yeah, I believe in God. And at the end of your life, you're thinking that belief of God in your brain is somehow going to get you to heaven. Yeah, sure, no, I believe in God. And at the end of your life, you're going to stand before Jesus. And say, but Lord, Lord, didn't, didn't I do all these things? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. No, but I, I, I knew about you. But I never knew you. You knew about me. You went to church and heard the stories about me. You even told people you believed I was real. But it was unproductive. It was fruitless. It was pointless. James says, it's dead. Faith without works is dead, a dead faith, but a spiritual death. You think your belief in God's going to get you to heaven? At the end of your life, God's going to pull up that peanut plant and find out a single peanut on the roots. You think that belief's going to get you to heaven? That faith doesn't have works, though. It's a dead faith, pointless and unproductive. So what evidence do you have in your salvation in your life? What works can you point to as proof that you've been saved? Don't misunderstand me. Just doing good things doesn't save a person. But a saved person ought to be able to point to the good works. For the one person that says, I do all these things, but that person lacks faith. To another that says, yeah, I believe, but they lack any fruit in their life. They go together. They're friends. They're sisters. They don't need to be reconciled. They're on the same team. It's not a debate. Paul and James aren't yelling at each other. They're presenting the same truth to two different people. Do you have faith in your life? Saving faith. Do you have works in your life as evidence that you've been saved? Do you realize that one or both are lacking in your life? What are you waiting for? Give your heart to Jesus today. Stop believing in him and give him your heart. Let him change your life. Please stand with me this morning right where you are. As our musicians are getting into place, I hope today that you simply just taking a look at your own life and ask yourself, do I have faith? Not do I believe, not do I have knowledge, not do I have an assessment of facts like I believe that George Washington was a president. No, do you trust in Jesus? Are you faithing Jesus? 
Are you putting everything you have in Jesus? Putting all your eggs in his basket? Are you trusting in him? Do you have the faith as the works as evidence? Is there a proof in your life you're saved? If you're lacking that this morning, call out to God. Come talk to me. Come pray with somebody. And we'll show you how to know for sure that you're saved. Don't make the mistake of dying without Jesus. Don't think that the good things you've done will get you to heaven. Don't think that being here or knowing about God will get you to heaven. It's unproductive. If you don't know for sure that you go to heaven, if you die, step out from where you are. Come down here. Don't put it off. Today may be your last day on earth. And give your heart to Christ if you don't know that you're saved this morning. Father, please move among us. If someone needs to get saved, if someone needs to put their trust in you, cry out to you, I pray they do it just now. Right now. Let them step out. Let them come. Let them do what they need to do to know that they're right with you. And I just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is